after this morning's start, we are returning to Sanskrit manuscripts. And uh, since um, this morning, I've been thinking I should perhaps introduce a correction to this title because um, Jim has uh, very nicely uh, treated this broader topic. Um, so I'm proposing a scriber correction here and I have expanded my title a bit. So it will be data management in the critical edition of Sanskrit Buddhist manuscripts of the Vajra Tunda Samaya Kalpa Raja. So this I propose will be a case study within this broader topic of editing Sanskrit manuscripts. And first I'm presenting uh, my introductory findings about this particular text and then we can move to data management in this specific, specific case. So we do not know about this text too much. Um, the only reference I'm aware of from, is from about a hundred years ago. Um, two publications by Lawrence Austin Vodell one in 1912 and 1914 mention this text. And in yellow, you can read the summary, what this text is about. It is against Nagas to protect crops and cause seasonable rain. And Vidal, two years later, translated the first chapter of this text from the Tibetan. And he only listed this text as extant in Tibetan. And this is the only reference to this text I'm aware of. Almost a hundred years passed, and a few years ago, our colleague and friend, Peter Daniel Santo in Oxford, informed me that while he was researching on Vajrayana texts, he came across an earlier Dharani text. And <coughs> then, uh, with his kind permission, this text was accepted into this very project, the Beyond Boundaries project. So I started work on it three years ago. So before we uh, move on to the introduction, um, this is what I've been doing, I have been doing the first critical edition and translation of this text in Sanskrit on the basis of the now found Sanskrit original text. So this text uh, belongs to a genre which we can call Kalpa Raja, a king of ritual instructions and its specification is Vajra, Beak, Wow, and Vodel uh, very aptly referred to this, that this is the Beak of Garuda. It consists of six chapters, and after careful examination of some secondary literature, I have come to a preliminary conclusion that it probably belongs to the fourth, fifth, or sixth centuries CE, fifths probably most likely. Um, we have a Tibetan translation from around 800 CE. It's listed in one of the earliest catalogs and uh, quite surprisingly there's no Chinese translation surviving. We have some Chinese texts which are uh, quite close uh, in that topic but no a direct translation we know of. So what's this text about, briefly? Uh, there are Naga serpents, residents in or near waters, and they are considered responsible for the amount of rainfall in a certain region. Then agriculture, of course, greatly depends on, water, on, on weather, and the Buddhist Sangha uh, the Buddhist uh, community found that through control over Nagas they can obtain worldly support. So by the mid-first millennium CE 
richer traditions developed which promise better control and other agriculture related benefits. So the six chapters of this text uh, contain narratives. We have uh, plenty of spells which are called dharani or vidya or mantra. <coughs> Lots of benefits if one uses this tradition. And uh, we have vows which the Nagas take that they shall provide good weather with sufficient rainfall in a certain reg region. And uh, this refers uh, to the title of the text, the Vajra Tunda Samaya, the vow of the Vajra Tunda. And this Vajra Tunda is the Vajra Beak, which is a threat if these Nagas do not provide good weather they shall be ruined by the Vajra Peak of Garuda. So this is the reference back to the title. And this text contains lots of ritual instructions, and I think uh, it's a really a rich uh, storehouse of these rites. So let me give you quickly a few examples how this controlling of the weather works. Um, one has to subjugate the Nagas, who are responsible for this. I have listed here five examples how to do that. One should do recitation within a mandala, or sometimes called mandalaka, to seal the boundaries, and then Naga figures of cow dung, clay, or wax should be bound by stakes, kila. Or the Dharani spell should be mounted at the top of a flagstaff and placed in the middle of a field. Then throwing ritual offerings, mostly mustard seeds or special pills or enchanted water into the Naga Lake, which is nearby and considered to be the residence of Nagas traditionally. Um, the fourth example, a Garuda image should be painted on a sword and it should be waved. And finally, the spell master, the Vidyadara, should enter the residence of the Nagas and convert them to the Buddha's teachings. So these are methods, just a few methods. Uh, there are many more in this text, uh, how to subjugate Nagas and uh, provide good weather in this way. So protection is guaranteed through the use of this tradition. Um, I have listed here a few examples. Uh, the danger of drought or excessive rain is averted, uh, there will be no lightning, uh, cold spells, winds and animals will not come near your crops uh, or groves. And on this final slide you can read a few things uh, which I consider important uh, within this text. Um, since it comes from around the 5th century, um, it's a useful source for the early um, <coughs> applications of ritual spaces called mandala or mandalaka. Um, it also includes many references, many early references to hand gestures, mudra, and uh, I was uh, quite interested to learn that there are pesticides uh, used in, Buddhist, uh, in a Buddhist context and this text describes how to use these pesticides. So this was an introduction to the text in general and now we can turn to data management, <coughs> how we manage an edition of a Sanskrit text. So, um, as Jim mentioned, it took them about two years to collect all manuscripts, cop copies of all manuscripts. Um, for me, it took about one and a half to collect four manuscripts. Yeah. You, can, you can see reproductions of all here. This is what I call manuscript A, and this is uh, a part of that, and this is manuscript B. Manuscript C, this is a palm leaf manuscript, the previous two were paper manuscripts, and this is manuscript 
D. So we have four manuscripts, and these are listed here. Two of them, C and A, these were discovered by, Pe by Peter Santo, and uh, B and D, uh, they were found by myself. So you can see the dates. We have one palm leaf manuscript undated, incomplete, from the 12th, 13th centuries, and we have three complete paper manuscripts from the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. So, um, one thing which I should refer to um, here, all these manuscripts are multiple text manuscripts, and possibly this is why this text was not really found in Sanskrit for a very long time. These were hide, hiding, I mean, this text was hiding uh, in these multiple text manuscripts. So what happens if we have all the manuscripts ready? What do we do with the data on all these manuscripts? <coughs> we collate them, as Jim has mentioned, and uh, I have been using a positive apparatus that is um, whenever there are variant readings, I list the reading uh, or the readings in the main text, and then I read the variants. See the first example, which is Chakra Karam, which is read in manuscripts C and D, whereas uh, A reads Chakaram and B reads Chakra Kara. Um, in the fourth example, you can see with PC and AC, if there was a correction in the manuscript, uh, AC means before correction, PC after correction, so D here uh, before correction reads Vibhu Takaya, uh, one uh, syllable missing, whereas after correction it reads Vibhu Kaya, adorned uh, body. In the last example, you can see uh, that B uh, is um, broken off or <coughs> it is illegible, so I have indicated here four aksharas are missing in the case of Om Amrite, part of a mantra in A, C, and D. Um, with such a positive apparatus, it is uh, possible to provide all the information, I believe, without anything being lost or anything being mixed up. After um, this um, collection of data, we can say, of course, comes something which is very difficult to define or explain how to prepare the addition, how to make editorial decisions, and this can be a very long process, and one has to go back to the text very often, and I believe uh, one has to spend uh, as much time as possible uh, with the text to come close to this uh, very piece of writing. Um, we have heard about uh, various um, programs which help with making additions, uh, preparing critical additions. Um, I'm trying to follow the old school and I think spending time with the text as much as possible is quite beneficial and that's, that's my experience. Then of course when one reaches um, a kind of uh, text which one thinks is uh, more or less intelligible, then one can start preparing a translation, but this works vice versa, so sometimes you have to return to your edition and uh, think uh, more about reading or more. 
Um, after this is done, uh, then our project plans to publish uh, this as an open access publication, which can be downloaded from the publisher's website. So outreach data presentation, it will be completely public and accessible for everyone for free. And uh, after this is done, uh, we also have plans to put the text itself, the Sanskrit text, uh, online. And uh, Jim has talked about Sarit, and we are planning to put the Sanskrit edition on uh, Sarit. And after this, we can also put the text on another site, which is called Gretil. And um, this is not a TEI, a marked up uh, based website, but it's the largest uh, repository of Sanskrit or Indic texts uh, available. So this is basically what I wanted to show you through this case study and probably we can return to some of the questions or new questions related to the addition of Sanskrit manuscripts. Thank you. two suggestions which I would make <coughs> strongly with emphasis. First, I, I understand your positive apparatus, it's nice, but I think you also have to document your choices. Mm. I'm not talking about data, documentation, whatever, but you as an editor make a choice. This is a better reading. Why do you think that? And I think that it's an editor, editor's responsibility to explain that in each and every case. And sometimes it's really simple, like the text is ungrammatical this way, but you can explain that an akshara has dropped it. And sometimes it's much more complicated than that. The second thing is, and um, it's sometimes a feature of Sarit, that I think that we should all, all of us, should seek to establish regular numbering for texts in a kind of biblical fashion. <laughs> chapter, verse, line, sentence, whatever, such that when somebody finds a new manuscript, it plugs in. When you decide to, somebody decides to make an edition of the Tibetan translation, it will, if somebody finds a Chinese translation, you'll be able to coordinate things like that and find references. I really think this is very important. And that's something that um, is part of that process that you talked about, sort of, um, reciprocal process between edition and translation, because you might not be able to do it until you've actually carefully understood the text and its structure. But I think in the end, it really is essential. Also, it means that um, your apparatus can simply be, you can simply cite lemmas, which refer to your numbering in the same way it works in the Bible. And you can make a glossary, you can make a dictionary, people can refer exactly and I'm very much in favor of this, even though it's a lot of work. Yeah, thank you very much. In the uh, same way, I mean, if I say to you Mark 15, 5, mm. you can open up any Bible and you find it, right? We should be able to do that. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Sorry. Um, I'm starting with your second question. Yeah. Um, as I have mentioned, this text has six chapters, yeah. and these have sub colophones. So I have already numbered chapters from one to six. Um, of course, then comes the question whether we should further subdivide these chapters into smaller chunks that can be decided. This I have done previously with another text. So I absolutely agree this would be an ideal world if all these texts were very clearly, perhaps line by line, uh, marked up. Um, as for your first uh, suggestion, uh, this will absolutely be done, uh, but not in the apparatus, not in the critical apparatus uh, at the bottom of the page uh, with the Sanskrit, but with the annotated translation, where in the annotations one can explain a choice, uh, whether it's grammatical or context-based. So it will be there. 
but I don't understand the, the annotations of the translation refer to the translation, but not necessarily to your looking and saying, um, for example, well, I don't think there was an example there, but sometimes you may have some version has a sentence with a, yeah, if you, if you look at, um, for example, just take the second one, very easy. It's, there's no problem here. In fact, you are, two manuscripts have one reading, one letter has dropped in the second one, and the other one, the Anuswara, has disappeared. It's easy to explain that, but I think it should be explained. It should be explained, yes, absolutely. And um, I, I, have, I have not really seen a, an addition where these explanations are included below the Sanskrit, so that's why I would People go... People usually don't explain anywhere. Yeah, and, so... And, you, and I have personal experience of asking people, <coughs> why did you do it this way? Oh, I don't remember. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Really? Yeah. It's your yeah. edition. Yeah. So, so my, my plan would be to put explanations at the relevant places uh, with the translations, but um, if we have better solutions, I'm very yeah, much I, open to that. But it will aware. be there. It will be there. This is absolutely. also something where actually the, that explanation level of explanation doesn't have to be visible unless somebody wants to see it. Why did you pick this? Then click a button or something like that. For most people, they trust the editor, as they should. What the classicists would do in the old world is aligned to the text rather than the translation. And uh, I don't know why we don't. Indians love commentaries, classicists love com commentaries, but Indologists don't. It's strange. <laughs> I believe I have seen some endnotes in some editions explaining choices. So I think that's another yeah. um, option to use endnotes yeah, uh, with the, the Sanskrit. Is, a, is really not a big issue. Yeah, Somewhere. yeah, it's it's it certainly it should be there. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Congratulations on finding this text. That's well, great. congratulations to Peter. Yeah. Uh, one or maybe two other questions. Um, um, so I understood that did you not consider international translation for your study, or do you consult sometimes? Um, I do. Um, uh, I have uh, asked for the help uh, of Tibetologist colleagues, um, and we have read the text together. And uh, I'll have to think, or we will have to think, how to incorporate Tibetan into the edition, whether we should indicate within the apparatus what the Tibetan reflects or put the whole Tibetan text in an appendix so it's avail available in the, in the volume so um, it's an ongoing uh, process and we should uh, absolutely include the evidence which is reflected in the Tibetan translation, yes. I'll ask a question, if you don't mind. It's, uh, so you're planning on putting this in SARID. SARID is in PEI. PEI has conventions about how to mark up uh, text critical editions. It sounds to me like your intention is to write the thing basically in Word, get it ready to, this is the way it seemed like you were saying, you get it ready, ready in Word, you send it to the publisher, they typeset it, however they're going to typeset it. Once it's printed, then you say, okay, now how do we make it in SARID? And it seems like maybe actually marking it up in the solid way as you work will make it be able to be saved in solid and printed, for instance, through LaTeX uh, as is supposed to be possible. <laughs> yeah. If you follow the solid yeah. yeah. I, I second that. Yeah. <coughs> there, there are people who will do it for you. There's a place in the Monticello that will convert the file into the uh, that's what, that's what we're going to do anyway. Because we're, like, like I was going to say this earlier, but we're inputting all our files in LaTeX. Uh, 
because people at the conference in Vienna in May, the experts always did tell me that it's a long way off from being able to go straight from XML to LaTeX at the moment. And I was feeling bad about the fact that we weren't inputting in XML, and these guys all said, no, no, keep, keep, keep doing what you're doing. And then I was told about this place, Moro, Lach, and I, Pondicherry, that will convert your file into XML. I mean, you could just save the doc file as XML, but so what are they? Well, they were putting into the TEI encoding. Oh, okay. Sorry, not just XML. Thank you. Yeah.